All right, you ready for some more schizo science? Are you ready to prove catastrophism is real? Here we go. So this article I found was written, or at least published in 1893. Looks like it may have been written in 1892. Anyway, late 1800s, this is the kind of science that was being done. Now, the reason why I wanna bring this article to everybody's attention is because if we are going to take all of our ancestors' histories at, at legit face value, right? All of our ancient ancestors' histories have some crazy stuff that they talk about. And of course, mainstream chalks this up to their, you know, mental insanity or just, you know, s general stupidity about not understanding some basic things. Like, they, they could only think in fantastical, dumb ways. They couldn't possibly record anything the way it actually was. So, if we're going to listen to our ancestors when they talk about, say, mountain high walls of water rolling across continental landscapes we better have evidence that that actually happened because if you're going to have a mountain sized wall of water rolling across a landscape then that's got to leave something behind i mean something has to there's got to be an after effect of that not just that it you know swept everybody away and killed people i mean the landscape itself would have to be forever altered so we should be able to find that evidence, especially because the claims that are being made by our ancestors, these did not happen like 100,000 years ago or a million years ago. This stuff literally happened only in the past few thousand years, with the exception of the deluge event, which may have been, I, I don't have a date for that, you know, five, six, 12,000 years ago. That That's a different story. But in this case, what we're going to be seeing here is we're going to be seeing a scientist back in the late 1800s talking about the evidence that he finds that he has no other way of explaining away other than saying, hey, look, at some point in time, all of, all of Europe and the Mediterranean had to have been either submerged, like dropped a thousand feet into the ocean immediately, instantly, and then the land would have had to have rebounded instantly as well. So basically, imagine all of Europe and the Mediterranean area. Something happens and all of a sudden that entire landmass just goes <laughs> right into the ocean. Thousand feet down. Just takes a couple of minutes. No, no questions, no qualms. It just pow, down. Or, or at some point, there must have been a 1,000 foot wall of water, a mountain of water, that must have rolled over the landscape. He comes to this conclusion because as he's looking at the geological evidence, he has nothing else in his tool set to explain why he is finding what he is finding in the strata around these areas of Europe and the Mediterranean that is displaying clear evidence of some sort of submergence, very quick submergence, and I mean instant submergence, not, not over thousands of years or millions of years. This had to have happened very quickly. He is finding all of this evidence and he has nothing else to explain it away. He can't use the actions of rivers or, or lakes or rain. He, he can't use any of this. And so he does good science here. What this? I'm gonna read this article, article to you guys and, and you can see what good science is. He comes to this conclusion out of looking at the observable evidence that he finds. He looks at the actual scientific evidence that he gathers from these areas and then he makes his conclusion. He does not go in with a preset idea of what he's trying to find. Now this is, this is the good science and that is why I want to read this to you guys so that all of you out there who are doing this kind of research can at least go and look at this article as well and add one more bullet point to your information if you're trying to build a case for catastrophism. Alright, let's get into this. So this article was printed in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of London, Volume 53, Issue 321 through 325. December 1893, and I will leave a link to it in the comments, or whatever the heck that is. On the evidences of a submergence of Western Europe and of the Mediterranean coasts at the close of the glacial, or so-called post-glacial, period, and immediately preceding the Neolithic or recent period, by Joseph Prestwich. Abstract. 
In a communication made earlier this year, 1892, to the Geological Society, the author showed that in the south of England, besides the superficial drift deposits of river, sea, and glacial origin, there was yet another which could not be referred to any of these agencies, and which he was led to conclude was the result of a submergence of not less than 1,000 feet at the close of the so-called post-glacial period. Now, they're going to use the term post-glacial, and, and I like how they use the so-called post-glacial period. It's interesting, back during this period of time, people still were not buying into the whole Ice Age theory grift that goes on nowadays. To one extent or another, they were still trying to be objective and they weren't buying into the garbage yet. So anyway, you're going to see some of that attitude displayed here. All right. This drift, unlike the others, does not contain either fluviatile or marine remains, nor does it exhibit any traces of glacial action. Its component materials are always derived from the adjacent hills and none from a distance, so that they have undergone little or no wear, whilst the only organic remains are those only of land animals and of land shells. While possessing these characters in common, this drift, to which the author gives the general term rubble drift, assumes a variety of forms or phases. Another peculiarity of this drift is that it is dispersed from many centers in a manner which would result on the hypothesis of late Mr. W. Hopkins of Cambridge, from divergent currents. If a considerable area at the bottom of the sea were elevated at a given rate and under certain depths of water, some forms of this drift, especially the ones overlying the raised beaches of the channel, have long attracted attention. The origin of that unstratified rubble has been attributed to, first, an excessive rainfall and great cold, second, snow and ice slides on slopes, third, waves of translation, fourth, flood and fluviatile action during a period of great cold. The author has already stated the objections that occur to him to these several explanations, some of which no doubt meet certain of the required conditions, but none of them embrace the whole and they all involve consequences incompatible with the other phenomena. They also depend on agencies that involve an amount of friction and weathering which is conspicuously wanting from the rubble drift. There is the further objection that this drift often exhibits results due to a force of propulsion for which the suggested causes are manifestly inadequate. So basically, all the excuses that geologists have made up until this point, talking about what he's calling this rubble drift, or they're all, none of them work. Like they all, some can kind of work here and there, but none of them explain the whole. And remember, it's important to explain the whole because this all happened at one particular period of time. So it can't have happened over millions of years. So anyway. The object of this memoir is to show that there is evidence of drift beds having the same origin extending over Western Europe and the coasts of the Mediterranean. In generalizing phenomena so widely spread, the author has to depend to a great extent on other observations other than his own. And that's just life of science, right? But that's okay. Owing to their number, only the more prominent cases have been selected, and only such particulars can be given as will serve to prove that, howsoever they will differ in detail, they all point to a common cause and agree in showing that all are explicable on the hypothesis proposed by the author, namely, of the submergence of the land concurrent with a subsequent upheaval. As an aside, really quick, this is not the very first article that I found written in the 1800s that questions the main narrative and actually brings up the point that, hey, the evidence that we are seeing right now, it really does show that there was some pretty crazy catastrophic, wait, catastrophic, is that a word? No, it's not. Catastrophism. There was crazy catastrophic things going on in our past. Here's the evidence for it. 
we need to interpret this correctly. Like they were already doing that, you know, even hundreds of years ago, this stuff was going in the right direction. We have since way lost our way. Anyway, okay, let's go. This next section is titled France. On the coast at Sangate near Cape Blanc Nez, I'm not going to be able to pronounce everything, I'm sorry. The rubble drift, which assumes the form termed head by Sir H. de la Beche, overlies a raised beach, the section being in almost every respect identical with that at Brighton. The rubble is derived from the adjacent chalk and Pliocene strata and has, as Brighton, the appearance of having been shot over the old cliff in lenticular masses, the most massive and prolonged being the one projected on the top. This rubble contains the remains of mammoth and some entire land shells. Near Abbeville, a very similar drift about 40 feet thick follows the slope of the hill, but here it forms four divisions corresponding with the main movements of upheaval. The last is remarkable from the circumstance that the edges of the beds are turned over and reversed in the same way that the head over the raised beach at Portland is reversed. Passing on to the Channel Islands, a raised beach surmounted by a head surrounds both Jersey and Guernsey, showing that in the later glacial times, as now, those islands were separated from the mainland. As the materials of the head, which is not a mere talus, are all of local origin, they must have been carried down by an agent acting in a quaquaverse? What the hell is a quaquaverse? Hold on. Quaquaversal in American English. Geology, directed outward from a common center toward all points of the compass, dipping uniformly in all directions. Oh, wow, interesting. Bam, they see that there? See, that's crazy. All right, let me reread that. As the materials of the head, which is not a mere talus, are all of local origin, they must have been carried down by an agent acting in a quaquaversal, quaquaversal direction from the center of the islands, where the hills form plateau 300 to 400 feet high, often covered by loam or loess. And just so everybody knows, loess yeah, this is what it means, Lois, a loosely compacted yellowish-gray deposit of wind-blown sediment of which extensive deposits occur. See, that's the problem with having, like, studying ancient historical stuff. You have to learn all these other sciences, right? So now, that's cool, but you have to do that to even begin to understand what your ancestors are even talking about. You have to have, like, a doctorate in, like, eight million different sciences. All right, all right let's go on. Where was that? Uh... As there are no rivers to have originated the required floodwaters, this Lois cannot have had a fluvatile origin. Nor, as there are no higher grounds, could it have been the result of rainwash. Neither can it be the result of the disintegration of the surface rocks. It must therefore have had an origin different from that usually ascribed to the Lois, and of which the author attributes to the deposition of sediment from the turbid seawaters during submergence whilst the head results from the surface debris together with a portion of this previously deposited sediment swept off by a divergent currents during upheaval. The Lois. And I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that correctly, so sorry. All right, the Lois. After further reference to the phenomena on the west coast of France, the author resumes the question which has given rise to much controversy, namely, that of the origin of the Lois, which extends over such large tracts in Western and Central Europe. That a certain section of it within valleys is due to river floods, there can be no doubt. But there is another selection, recognized as such by most continental geologists, to which it is not possible to assign that origin. The latter is not confined to the river valleys, but is found on the dividing watersheds and on the high plains separating the river basin. In the north of France, it attains a height of 400 to 600 feet, 
but in the neighborhood of Lyons, it reaches to 1,300 feet, whilst in the great upper valleys of the Rhine and the Dan Danube, it attains to an altitude of 1,500 feet, which is even exceeded further to the east. It there covers the high plains of Hungary and southern Russia and is by no means restricted to valleys and depressions on the surface. Various theories have been proposed to account for this wide dispersion of the Loess. The two principal of which attribute its formation. 1. To a depression of Central Europe, whereby the gradient of the upper valleys was greatly reduced, while no change of level occurred nearer the sea. Oh, that's interesting. 2. To the advance of the great northern ice sheet blocking the large rivers of Eastern Europe and damming back their waters, so that's the ice dams that people try to cope with. Three, to storm winds acting upon disintegrated rock surfaces. The author points out the objections to these several views and shows that such an accumulation of silt would necessarily be one of the consequences of the submergence he suggests that it is such a sedimentation that would fall from the turid waters as they slowly advanced or rested, whilst as they retreated those portions of this sediment most exposed to the affluent currents would be again swept away. As with the other phases of the rubble drift, the organic remains of this loess are those of a land surface only. So that's interesting. That means that what he's talking about Oh, so he's not saying ocean waters overran it. He's literally just saying the continent dropped beneath the water. How the hell do you get the water then? Ah, let's keep going. All right, this is interesting. I'm trying to... So this may have been... Hey, this may have been when the, uh, when the Mars event happened and not the Venus. Wow, okay. Uh, let's keep going. Where was I? In the... So All right. <clears throat> In the south of France and inland, the author refers to the Ociferons Breccius of Nice, Antibes, Set, Pedemar, and Santene to one phase of the rubble drift. I don't know what, sorry, I don't know if I pronounced those wrong. At all of these places, the Breccia, which contains the remains of the mammoth, woolly rhinoceros, and other quaternary animals, occurs in fissures on isolated hills oh yeah this is a whole other ball of wax all right in explanation of their presence it has been suggested that the bones are those of animals which fell into the fissures while still open or else that they were remains brought together by predaceous animals and that theory's already been destroyed all that stuff has already been destroyed let's see if they destroy it here but neither of these opinions can be correct, for no skeleton is found entire, no bones in place, and none of the bones have been gnawed by, con by, by carnivora. As Monsieur Gaudry also asks, in discussing the facts presented by the fissure on the Montague de Sentine, a flat-topped hill near chalons sur seyonne I don't, sorry guys. Why would so many wolves, bears, horses, and oxen have ascended a hill isolated on all sides? The members of the Geological Society present at the reunion at which this remark was made seem to agree that the animals had met their death by drowning, but in what way was left indeterminate? Now, as, a, as an aside really fast to go along with this, we find this exact same phenomena all over the world. South America, North America, Africa, you name it. You find these this, this weird oddity all over the place. We'll get to that stuff way later in a different episode. Now, in all these cases, the fissures are in isolated hills with lower lands around. At Nice, the hill is 132 feet high. At Antibes, 250 feet. And at Cité which resembles on a small scale the Rock of Gibraltar, the hill raises 355 feet above sea level. Still more formidable are the hills inland. Mont Pedemar rises to a height of 1,128 feet, whilst Sentine is 1,640 feet high. Among the animal remains found in the fissures are those of, and he lists them. So for the carnivore section, they find Felis, lynx, wolf, hyena, bear. Remember, 
This is in France. They're find, finding hyena. They find for rodents. They find lagomies. And they find hair. For ungulates. What is an ungulate? Is that Anyway, they call it ungulates. Mammoth. Rhinoceros, wild boar, horse. So in France, we have mammoth, rhinoceros. Oh, interesting. Rhinoceros in France. Okay, so why are there rhinoceros bones up in France? And why are they that high up in altitude? And then they go on to say ox, deer, and antelope. I don't know if ox still exists in France. I'm sure deer and antelope are around there. Anyway, so these are found together with land shells of various living specimens. So I think most of the specimens that they just list are, are technically extinct. Which is correct, because that's what we find all over the world as well. The breccia, which is composed of sharp angular fragments of the local rocks embedded in the matrix of red clay or loam, is generally cemented by calcite. The bones are mostly broken and splintered into innumerable sharp fragments, and evidently are not those of animals devoured by beasts of prey, nor have they been broken by man. It is not possible to suppose that animals of such different natures and having such different habitats could in life ever have herded together. Difficult as the alternative is, the author sees no other explanation of the phenomena than that of a widespread temporary submergence, accompanied by strong earth tremors. Look at that. He's even calling out the earthquakes that would have happened. Amazing. He knows all. It's funny. It's funny. The evidence literally just leads him to all the other stuff that we have already discovered as well. He doesn't know any about, you know, the Venus and Mars stuff yet. In such a case, it is easy to conceive that as the waters gradually advanced over the lowlands, the animals of the plains would naturally seek safety on higher grounds and hills. Flying in terror and cowed by the common danger, the ruminants and other herbivores, together with the carnivores, would, as in the case of the flooding in our days of large deltas, alike seek refuge on the same safety spot. So basically you have water rising really quick, all animals are running from this, right? Doesn't matter what you are, carnivore, herbivore, you are trying to find a place of height to get away from the oncoming waters. And so that's one of the reasons why we find all of these numerous animals just smashed together. Well, the smashing comes next. Let's see what he goes with that. Where that spot was an isolated hill, they would, if it were not out of reach of the flood waters, eventually suffer the same fate. Subsequently, the detached limbs and bones carried together with the surface debris by the affluent currents into the open fissures were subjected to the clashing of the rubble and the fall of large fragments of rock from the sides of the fissures, and were crushed and broken in the way they are always found. All the results noted are in accordance with the consequences that would ensue under these conditions. So what we find, not just here, but we find it all over the world, there are literally just huge pockets of ancient animals. Like, you know, like they just said, you've got mammoth, woolly mammoth, rhinoceros, all these old, you know, what we think Stone Age animals. All of these animals have just been crushed, shattered, their bones, their limbs have just been thrown around. You need some sort of force to basically churn up all that mass. And that force is water in this case. And this water rises quick and it gets to them fast. And then you mix that in with all the debris and all the rock and everything. And everything just becomes a grinding pot, right? And it's not just rock and animal debris. It's also, you also have trees and all this other stuff. And we find all of that all over the world in these fissures. And in fact, in some areas of the world, back in the day, I don't think it's really done now, that stuff was actually mined for fuel. People literally were just coming across huge sections of biological decaying mass and they could grab that and they were able to burn it for fuel. That was actually a legit industry in a lot of places on the planet. Isn't that amazing? And what and what sucks though is because of, of how we have advanced, we are literally burning our, our evidence. This kind of stuff eventually won't exist in the future. There will be a time in Earth's history to where we won't have any evidence of this stuff simply because we actually used some of the destruction as a resource. It's just like coal and oil. Same thing with that. All right, this is getting long enough. I'm going to end it here. So basically what we have going on so far is this dude has discovered evidence for a very quick amount of water encapsulating and encompassing 
basically all of the Mediterranean and at least Europe. And of course, we have evidence for it all over the planet, but that's neither here nor there. So the main takeaway of everything we've read so far is this guy comes to the conclusion, not because he had a theory, not because he was like trying to prove Noah's flood or whatever. He is just finding himself in a position to where he is looking at the evidence and he's just following the evidence to a conclusion. Now, this is real science. This is why I wanted to read this article and I'll, and I'll read the rest of it in the next video. But this is what we want to see. If you find stuff like this, this is gold because this is how we want to approach subjects. So the next video, we'll finish up this article and we'll go over all of the evidence that this guy presents and see if it matches up with the electric universe catastrophism outcomes that we have from the other sciences and the other historical studies that everybody is doing.